So we're talking about sexual wholeness and we only have 40 minutes, which basically means you're going to be experts by the time we're done. Probably no questions at the end. So yeah, don't, don't worry at all. So like some of you, um, I didn't grow up in church and maybe like some of you, I am a same sex attracted Christian. So those two things immediately uh, have made sexual wholeness and the whole topic of sexuality, not really like an interesting hobby, but more like absolute survival mode for me. So like I said, I didn't grow up in the church. Like I thought Jesus was just like another person you sing about at Christmas, like Frosty the Snowman, Rudolph, baby Jesus. Like that was my category. And by the time I was in high school, I really realized two things about myself. One, um, I really, really, really liked school. In fact, it's maybe the only thing I'm good at. So I love, <laughs> I just, I loved school. I loved ideas. Um, and that part of my personality the people around me who identified as Christians, you know, I would try to ask them about the God thing because I hadn't grown up with it. And I just got answers that weren't that impressive. So eventually I got this idea. I'm like, Meh, maybe Christianity is just a thing that you like when you're kind of too stupid to think of your own ideas. Like it's a cute little crutch, but that's not for people who think for themselves. And I kind of became a jerk about it. I made a couple kids cry in high school. So I really developed this like strong atheistic bent. But the other thing I realized in high school is that the way my female friends felt about boys was actually how I felt about girls. Now, I really, I still enjoy the company of men. I really like men. But whenever I had like sexual romantic contact with them, it was always like, I don't know, it was just a little off. And you might be thinking, well, maybe that's because you were hooking up with teenage boys and you're not wrong, right? But later in high school, when I had romantic and sexual contact with other young women, I was like, oh, no, this is like, this is where my home is. And again, I hadn't grown up in the church and I didn't really, like there was nothing in my worldview that said anything about that would be wrong. Just to frame this for you too. My senior year of high school was 2003, this magical world before like same-sex marriage was even legalized quite yet, right? So it was right at this little tipping point. So I kind of knew from the air, like maybe this is a thing that people don't support. But when I kind of opened my junk drawer of moral ideas and rummaged around, I was like, I don't know, doesn't seem to be thing, anything wrong with it. So I just, you know, I just went with it. And also, without ever being mistreated by a Christian or by a church, I kind of knew that Christians hated gay people. Like I just sort of like, it was a thing I picked up from the air. So by the time I graduated high school, one, I thought Christians were idiots. And two, uh, I thought they were bigots. Right, so the fact that I'm doing this talk for like a crew movement still, still to me this day, like cracks me up. This is not at all what my 17 year old self would have thought would be in my future. So I went off to Yale University because I was tricked to moving to a place that's cold from Southern California. Now Milwaukee's probably colder than Connecticut. I don't really know, but it was a big, it was a big adjustment for me. And not just because I had to buy a coat really for the first time in my life, but also uh, because some pretty dramatic things happened. One, you know, I'd really like put my identity in the fact that I was so smart. And it turns out when you go to a crappy public high school and then try to go to a world-class university, you're no longer the smartest person in the room or like I wasn't. And that really, that was hard all four years, but it was particularly hard freshman year. So like crumbling that part of my identity. And then uh, also during my freshman year, the girl I was dating at the time who I was like obsessed with, um, she left me for this guy. And this is embarrassing, um, but she left me for a guy who hadn't graduated high school and who lived in a van and like not even a van. It was like a broken van. Like you had to get it rolling down a hill first to get the engine to engage. And like, that's just it's just embarrassing to be left for that guy, you know? So I was feeling tender. I was feeling low. My identity was fragile, but it wasn't like I was sitting there thinking, oh, I should turn to Jesus. Cause like, I didn't believe in Jesus. So I, I thought, well, uh, I don't know who I am really. Like I, I was back at school. They call it spring semester, but it's like freezing cold, you know? And I'm thinking, I don't know. I need like I need hobbies or something. I need to write for the school newspaper, except I'm not smart enough. Or I need to go to the gym more, except I'm super lazy. And so I was like, okay, what am I supposed to do with this? So I happened to be in a lecture one day early in the semester. And they were lecturing on the 
old dead thinker, Rene Descartes. He's the guy who invented the phrase, I think, therefore I am, which you've probably heard of. And actually from that phrase, he builds this whole proof for the existence of God. And I was sitting in the audience that day, I was thinking, this is a really stupid proof for the existence of God, which I still think. But while I was sitting there, I was like, you know, I'm a really committed atheist, but like, what if there are better proofs for the existence of God than this one? And I remember thinking, no, that's not what we think. That's for stupid bigots. Like we don't go there. But I also was like, well, I don't know. What if there's something to this? So I'm an older millennial. So I did what older millennials do. I opened my gigantic laptop with my two hands and I just started Googling random religious search terms. You know what I mean? This is just, that was just what you have an important question, ask the internet. That's, that's what we all know, right? Why would you ever do that? This is what we do. And I just kept coming back to reading about the person of Jesus. And it would be so funny. My roommates would come in and I would be so embarrassed by looking at this stuff that I would like slam my computer shut like I was a middle school kid caught looking at porn on the computer or something. But I was like reading about Jesus, you know, I'm like, oh no, I'm doing my French homework, except I never was, which my grade proved. So I had all these caricatures in my mind about who Jesus was. Remember, this is 2004. And I had kind of pictured him maybe like an ancient George W. Bush wrapped in a toga. It was not a particularly like mesmerizing image. But when I was reading about him, I was like, wait, this character's kind of interesting. Like he's kind of, he's kind of really smart. I really love the scenes where he would like take down his opponents. And he's also sort of like tender. I was kind of, but I also felt like I'm not supposed to be like interested in Jesus as a character because I want to marry a woman someday. And that's just not, that's just not okay. The only two people I knew at Yale who identified as Christians were these two girls who were dating each other. And one of them was training to be a Lutheran minister. And so I thought, maybe they know something I don't know. You know what I mean? And yes, I met them in marching band because no, I've never been cool. Right. So I remember going to them and being like, okay, so tell me, this seems to me like it's not compatible. So how, how are you guys viewing this? And they were like, oh yeah, it's all been a big misunderstanding. Like the Bible actually supports same-sex marriage. I was like, really? That's super interesting. And they gave me a packet explaining the correct interpretations. And I love a packet. So I took it back to my room and I was ripping through it. And the stuff that it said was super interesting and made a lot of sense. Like it, it made sense to me as I was reading it. And I thought, this is, this is really interesting. But I also thought, okay, well, I don't really know the Bible, but maybe I should look at the verses that this packet is claiming to interpret. So I pulled it up, you know, I pulled up the different scriptures they were talking about, again, through the internet, it's not like I owned a Bible. And again and again, I just kept looking at the screen, looking at the packet back and forth and thinking, oh, like, I'm not a Bible scholar, but I'm literally only good at reading and writing. I don't think that's what these texts mean. And like these, these girls were my friends, they were sweet, but like, I think this just doesn't hold any water. And I remember mostly feeling angry, like feeling duped, throwing my packet into like my cheap dorm trash can and it falling over and being like, whatever, I shouldn't even be interested in this kind of stuff. But a little while after that, I happened to be in the room of an acquaintance of mine and I was standing in her doorway and she was like in her room putting stuff in her bag or whatever. And next to her doorway, she had a bookshelf. And one of my favorite hobbies is to look at people's bookshelves and judge them. So while she was getting her stuff, I was scanning the bookshelf, and I see she has a copy of this book called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Now again, I wasn't raised in the church, so it didn't ring all those Narnia bells for me, you know, but the title was super interesting. And I thought, oh, I've only been reading the internet. Maybe I need to read this book, but I was too embarrassed to ask my friend for the book because I didn't want her to know. So I just stole the book because like, honestly, it fits into a bag super easy. She wasn't looking. So there we go. Yes, I still have this copy of the book because I was too embarrassed to give it back to her. I don't even know where she is in the world anymore. So she's probably not missing it. So I was reading this book in the library one day between classes because it was easier than my homework. And while I was reading it, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the reality, like not only does a God exist, like a store brand type weird God or something, but the God who made me exists. And it wasn't like a particular page or paragraph or sentence I was reading. I don't know, it was just in the course of reading it, I stopped one day and I thought, oh, the God who made me exists, the God who is 
holy exists. And I didn't know the vocabulary word holy, but that sense of his perfection, his transcendence. And immediately I felt afraid because I was not by any stretch of the imagination, a good person. I was mean, I was uh, arrogant, I lied, um, I was sexually immoral, I cheated. I was reading a stolen book, you know what I mean? It's like all the chips were clearly pushed into the guilty category. I was thinking very not safe for work language, right? And so I'm thinking, what am I supposed to, like, I can't, I can't get out of this on my own. And really quickly with that, I, I think the spirit made it clear to me that um, part of the reason Jesus had come was to place himself as a barrier between God's wrath and me. And that the only way to be safe was to run towards him, not away from him. I remember sitting there thinking, I don't want to be a Christian. Like, that's really lame, you know? But also, I can't pretend that this isn't true just because it's inconvenient for my life. Like, I'm not going to get a better deal than this, you know? I got I to gotta take this deal. So I didn't have a nice crew staff sharing the gospel with me and telling me to pray a prayer. But I kind of knew sort of in instinctually, I guess I was supposed to pray. So I closed my eyes and I was like, fine, I'll be a Christian. And then I just went to class because what else are you supposed to do? So I happened to see a little advertisement for crew at Yale. They were going to have a Valentine's party. They were called Yale Students for Christ. And I showed up at their party pretending I was there by accident. And they were like, where'd you come from? And I was like, I just became a Christian two days ago. And they were like, oh, and so I just followed them around like a baby quail. You know what I mean? I went to Bible study, gave me a Bible. I went to prayer, asked a million questions. They brought me to church. I stayed there the next 12 years. Um, you know, they taught me not to cuss so much, to make friends. They taught me, you know, that the music was pretty bad. Um, yeah, all the things you need to know to be an evangelical. And so I remember thinking, oh, this is so great. This is so great. But the thing was, um, my same-sex attraction didn't go anywhere. Like I was still attracted to women. And it's been 16 years, almost 17, I guess. And my attraction to women still hasn't gone anywhere. Um, and frankly, no matter who we're attracted to, most of us experience sexual desire, right? It becomes this, becomes this question and I, what to do with it. And I remember thinking, well, shoot, what am I supposed to do with this? And, and the first most important thing that the Lord really pressed me on had to do with my own questions back to him because I kept butting my head up against the why because I could see in the scripture that the Bible said no to same-sex lust and sexual activity and I've since learned Greek and Hebrew and it still says no okay so I, I got that it said no but I really I didn't understand why and I remember kind of negotiating with God I was like God if you could explain to me why you say no to this then I will obey with perfect joy and obedience, which is like ridiculous, but you know, these are the kind of things you do when you're negotiating with God. And it was so, um, the Lord really pressed back on me. He's like, hey, um, what if the most important question isn't, why am I asking this of you? That's an important question, but what if it's not the most important? What if the most important question is, can you trust the one who's asking? Because if you're only willing to obey when you understand and when you agree, then how are you not making yourself God? I remember spending a lot of time uh, then on the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. It's really interesting that God's first prohibition actually made no good sense. It's really interesting that even before sin entered the world, he still wanted us to live by faith and not by sight. It's this whole scenario, right? Adam and Eve, the beautiful garden. And God's like, hey guys, here's your one rule. And you'd think maybe it'd be something like, here's your one rule, don't murder each other. And we'd be like, yes, this is a very good rule because murder is kind of icky. Then they'd be lonely. Like we intuitively get that murder is wrong. If you do not intuitively know that murder is wrong, that is something you should talk to somebody about, right? Like we understand that. But instead, his rule was, hey, don't eat the fruit of this tree that's related to the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat it, you're going to die. Okay, so the rule is don't eat this particular fruit that's connected with something that looks valuable. 
I mean, even vegans eat fruit, you know what I mean? This, like, on the face of it, you're like, I don't really understand what's going on with this rule. Actually, you need to trust God to be able to obey the rule. And this is right where the serpent presses Eve. Right? He gets her to look. He's like, is that what God really said? He gets her to use her data to look at it. And she sees, oh, it, it looks good. It's going to taste good. It's desirous to make me wise. So suddenly she has all this data about why she should eat the fruit. And the only thing she has on the other side is God's word saying, if you do it, you're going to die. And we know later from when they do it, it's not like they drop dead, right? So it's a different type of death he's talking about. And she's got to choose, right? And if you're going to take a huge risk, you can only do that if the person asking you to do it is deeply, immediately trustworthy. And like God had given her all the reason in the world to prove that he was, that he was for her. But still there was this nagging question. He must be holding out on me, right? So she ate of the fruit. Adam ate of the fruit. We lived downstream from that bad decision. And for me, it felt so similar. Like I had all these reasons I could think of why the things God was saying about sexuality didn't make sense. And why, like, actually the things that I liked should make more sense and made more sense. The only thing I had on this other side was God's word saying, hey, don't do that. It's going to lead to death. And so it pressed me again and again into that question of, can I trust him? Not just can I trust him and, like, give him every Sunday morning when I could sleep in. But can I trust him with this most vulnerable place of my life, like this very tender place of my life? And over and over again in the person of Jesus, uh, I was forced to answer yes. And it's not just the answer of like, oh, he died for you. Like, absolutely. Like him dying for you makes him trustworthy. But the thing is, he didn't even have to come at all. He didn't have to leave the blessedness of the Trinity and come down here. I mean, Jesus lived a miserable life, like born in a backwater in an oppressed country to a poor family. By the time he's a grown up, his dad, his earthly father's dead. So, you know, he helped raise his younger siblings. He's wandering around as a homeless guy. All of his friends are idiots. And the people who should recognize him to worship him go on a three-year hunt to murder him. And then they do. Right? Like this is a guy, I don't, I'm not sure I would do that for anybody, let alone someone who is my enemy. But Jesus in his whole life and his death proved that he was for me. And this grounded over and over again my ability to say, oh okay, I think I can trust what you say. Like, you must be for me, not against me. It's a long time to spend before we've even talked about sexuality really at all, right? But I guess my broader point is when we try to understand what God has said about really anything, but particularly about sexuality as just these rules detached from a person, we immediately go off track. Like, this, these aren't just things that are like included in your Apple terms and services that you just click accept and then brush past like you don't really read them right like they're they're not random laws that need to be judged by us whether we like them or not they're they're from a a father who loves us they're from a, a God who made us that they, they have to be understood within his character and this really helped me even as I reframed other questions about sexuality because I still so honestly, like if God had never revealed to me anything else about the Bible, I think, you know, I could have been happy saying, okay, I can trust Jesus. Even if this is hard, I can trust him. I know he's for me. But I also got me thinking like, hey, maybe I'm misunderstanding something about the way that sexuality is talked about in scripture, because I'm, I'm hearing a lot of no, like no, 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 don't, don't, don't. But sex must also be, there must be something yes about it, right? Like it's not like God was hanging out in heaven and looked down and saw people having sex and thought, oh no, what are they doing with their bodies? I need to regulate this, right? Like he's clearly the one who invented it. He invented our bodies. There must be something positive that actually frames whatever's negative, right? Like my Honda Odyssey is designed to run on gasoline. That's the yes. Like it needs gasoline to get its gigantic engine running. I can't get mad it's not arbitrary or cruel that if I put maple syrup in the tank, the car's not going to run, right? Like the no makes sense because of the yes. And so much of what God's word said about sexuality sort of felt arbitrary or cruel. And I realized his character is not arbitrary or cruel. I must be framing some of this in a way that's a little bit off. 
And so I want to suggest that maybe there's a positive vision for God's sexuality that helps us understand so much of what God wants for us and how we steward our bodies. And I would, I would argue that you can't understand sexuality, what it's designed for, if you don't understand marriage. Everywhere in scripture that sex is portrayed in a positive way, it's connected with marriage. So if you want to understand what sex is, you have to understand what marriage is. So here's what I think. I think marriage has one job and that everything's supposed to be true about marriage, particularly even sex in marriage, is so that it serves that one job. The one job of marriage is to be a picture of God's relationship with his people. It's actually one of his favorite metaphors throughout the scripture, marriage, a picture of God's relationship with his people. And so this suddenly frames what he's saying about sexuality in some really interesting ways. So for example, scripture reflects that marriage is supposed to be faithful for, throughout your whole life. Why? Not just because it makes for good Hallmark movies, right? Because God's relationship with his people is faithful forever. Now, in the scriptures, God's always the faithful husband. His people are like the unfaithful bride. In the Old Testament, Israel is like only ever the unfaithful wife. It's not a great picture. Like Ezekiel 16 is a really depressing, quiet time. But then in the New Testament, God's people are able to be faithful because of what Jesus did. And so we see this new renewed picture. Sometimes when I'm talking to older, more conservative crowds who are a little more, um, they kind of get a little pearl clutchy when we start talking about same-sex marriage, I just want to remind them, you're super worried about same-sex marriage, but who has done more damage to what marriage is supposed to be when it comes to just faithfulness, straight people or gay people? It's definitely straight people, right? There's just more of you, okay? So like, Everybody has an equal role in trashing what sexuality looks like because it turns out we're all sinners and we break everything we touch. But there's just, there's just that, one, that first thing, faithfulness is this good that sort of sets a trajectory for what sexuality is about. Okay, faithfulness. But another good of marriage is actually sexual pleasure. God could have made sexuality extremely boring. He could have made it feel like cutting your toenails or something, right? Like this, that's totally possible. Instead, he made it extremely pleasurable. And that's really designed because God's relationship with his people is supposed to be extremely pleasurable and intimate. And actually, the way God desires us and the way we're supposed to desire him is actually akin to how powerful, um, how distracting even sexual desire can be. So there's this, um, there's that link there. It's supposed to be a reminder of something spiritual. Okay, so there's a second good, faithfulness, sexual pleasure. Actually, marriage is supposed to be the place of procreation or at least household building, like adoption is very valid too, right? Why? Because God's relationship with his people is all about building a new family. That's why we're called born again, brothers and sisters, God's our father. There's this family thing. Like part of the reason children are supposed to be for that family scenario is because it pictures God's relationship with his people and the church. One of the interesting things as we think about um, marriage is often we stop at those three things. You know, it's like faithful, good sex with your best friend forever and like kids if you want them but if you don't really like kids you can't afford them you get dogs or something you know people put dogs in strollers or whatever right so there's just this idea like oh that's what marriage is which is part of why we've gotten tripped up a little bit when we try to intuitively understand well what why does God say no to same-sex relationships because let's be honest two men can have all three of those things right two men can be faithful to each other forever they can experience sexual pleasure they can raise children. Two women can do all of those things. Intuitively, we usually get those three and we see that a same-sex couple can do all three. And that's usually why intuitively we come to scriptures and we're like, this doesn't, this doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right. So here's what I want to offer to you. And I'm not trying to claim it's going to intuitively click. I'm just going to try to offer it to you as something that scripture teaches. 
difference is actually a fourth good of marriage. Like the fact that marriage is male and female is specifically part of marriage. Now, partially that's because before like 30 years ago, you can't have procreation without it, right? God designed our bodies to work a certain way, but it's actually more than procreation too. It actually has to do with the metaphor of what marriage is. These two fundamentally different parties who are able to come together to create um, love across difference, to create this new relationship. It, it pictures even more fundamentally different parties of Christ and the church being able to come together, love across, dis, uh, across difference. If you take away one of the parties or if you duplicate them, there's, there's no longer this uh, picture of the gospel. And what's interesting too, when we come to this metaphor, it shows up all the time throughout scripture and God is always represented by the husband and his people are always represented by the bride. And that's not because the Bible's so ancient, it's like afraid of putting female language on God. I mean, there's plenty of times where he talks about carrying Jacob in his womb or nursing Israel at his breasts or like God's not afraid of female imagery when it's talking about motherhood because mothers are a valid picture of who God is. But when it comes to the marriage metaphor, um, He's always the husband, his people are always the bride. So you actually, for a marriage to do the job it's designed to do to represent the gospel, it actually needs to have all four things. And that really sets some of our parameters when we're thinking about sex is designed to be a major part of what marriage is and this picture of the gospel in the world. And even if we're not married, the fact that we experience sexual desire can still be a picture of the gospel. Because um, interestingly enough, when, uh, when the new creation comes down, we need to throw out this picture that we all go to be in heaven in this disembodied place. God's bringing new creation here, right? When God inaugurates the kingdom, um, we're, we're not married anymore, except we're all married. Like Jesus has this interesting thing in Matthew 22, like they don't, we don't get married in heaven. We're actually all a part of the bride of Christ. Now, if that makes some of you guys uncomfortable, just remember that we women are the sons of God. And so it all gets, there's a lot of um, gender play there in the scriptures. But it turns out that no matter what your state is here, whether you are single or married, you can be a picture of what the gospel is. To be in a faithful marriage, to be in a faithful Christian marriage is a picture of what the gospel is, a picture of God's relationship with his people and the beauty that brings but singleness is equally a gift. It's equally saying, even if I don't experience marriage here, because our culture, frankly, and our churches teach salvation by romance, right? They teach you're not, you're not really complete. You're not really a grown up. You're not really full unless you're married. That's garbage. Does anyone have read the New Testament? Like that doesn't even make sense. Actually, singleness is this beautiful opportunity to say like, oh, yes, these marriages are very good. They point to the gospel, but I'm not going to miss out on the real thing. These are like little toy cars. And someday I'm going to experience the real thing. I'm going to experience, I'm going to drive the real vehicle. This is like a tiny little uh, poster of an appetizer. And I'm getting invited to the actual banquet. Like a faithful singleness is an opportunity to say, with your whole life, I actually believe in the resurrection. I believe I'm not gonna miss out. Like I believe that I'm gonna be a part of the real marriage that's coming. So what that means for all of us, and I found so much hope for me in this early in my discipleship and, and even now, is it really relieved for me, one, my personal experience, of course, has to do with LGBT issues, but I'm sort of like, oh, this means I don't actually have to become straight. There's nothing in scripture that says become straight. Like straight is, I don't know if y'all have noticed, but like straight people are not automatically holy. Like it turns out straight people often sexually sin. So it's like, well, what's the point? Like that doesn't, that doesn't solve anything, right? It, it turns out whether you're attracted to men or women or both or neither or potted plants, God has given each of us two options for faithfulness with our sexuality. We can be faithfully single, or we can be faithfully married. And God, by his spirit, will equip us to be able to live that faithfulness in ways that honor him. And frankly, both callings are challenging. Both callings have difficulty. 
Um, both callings have sexual temptation. It's not like you get married and you're like, haha, like all of my dreams are fulfilled. Like it turns out you can still be attracted to people who aren't your spouse, right? Or so for so long, the church has sort of taught these really weird things about sexuality. But when we get to the scriptures, we actually see something um, pretty freeing, I think, right? It's this, it's this ability to say, no matter where I am, my sexual desire is not an enemy. It's not an evil trick that God's played on me. It's not a bug in the system. It's a way that he's designed me. And if I'm able to look through those desires to who he is, look through those desires to the gospel, and I'm holding fast to God's community and God's word and, and God's spirit, then, then those things, they don't have to be repressed. They don't have to be shoved away. We can actually talk about these things openly and with honesty and, and learn joyful obedience together. Now, I said that all, you know, in this happy, like, 30-minute thing. If you read my book, like, my, the early part of my discipleship life was, like, literally an open dumpster fire. If I were my 35-year-old self right now meeting with my 19-year-old self, I'd be like, this girl's not going to make it, right? So <laughs> I haven't been able to tell you the full story because we're limited time, but I have, I have a lot, I have plenty of scars when it comes to this topic, but continually, over and over again, his grace has been sufficient for me. I know his grace is sufficient for all of us. I functionally use most of the time just talking to you, which is not maybe the best use of our time, but why don't we do a little bit of questions, right? So you can, there are no stupid questions, you know, you can ask whatever, or I answered all of them perfectly, and now you never need to hear this talk again. Either one is fine, you know. I think you're supposed to text it to Hillary. Yeah, I think Hillary has some of the questions. So we oh, great. Move to our time of Q&A now. All right. Well, thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing your story with us, sharing from God's word. Um, yeah, I know I was blessed by hearing, uh, blessed and challenged by hearing from you. And you are hilarious, too. So I could listen to you talk for the whole night. Um, I run but out of time. As I'm getting questions in, um, this is a question I have. Um, oh, sorry. preferencing your own question. Well, that's what well, I'm you know, I haven't before. gotten any questions yet. So oh, you know, okay. you gotta okay. feel the time, right? So uh, you shared how, you know, what does it, you shared how you can be faithfully single or faithfully married. What does it look like for you right now to be faithfully married? Because you are married. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. So I've been married to a guy for 13 years. That's a, another surprise. Okay, really, like tragically, I met him on a summer mission, right? That's not the reason you should go. And people tried to recruit me that way. Like, oh, you might meet your spouse. I'm like, oh, is that why we go on mission? Is that why we're, we're tarnishing this, right? This is not, that's not the purpose of this. And then I met my spouse there. It's deeply shameful. But when we showed up, we both had a crush on the same girl. So it feels like a little different. But so I think um, part of because there was this thing that happened a little while ago in the church where everyone was really interested in making sure that gay disciples became straight disciples. And they, they had all these kind of tricks. To, it turn, you cannot change someone's orientation. God can if he feels like it, but he rarely does. Sort of like whether he decides to cure cancer or something, right? Like usually he just lets us be with our same-sex attraction. And so sometimes people would try to force us into straight marriages with this belief that like maybe if you have enough straight sex, you will become straight, uh, which really set a lot of people up for disaster. The people who were married, the people, you know, like everybody, it was really, really bad. Um, and so I don't want anyone to hear like, oh, like the right thing to do is to get married. That's not necessarily the right thing to do no matter what your attractional pattern is. However, I do think God called me to be married. Um, and if you met my husband, you'd be like, yeah, good. he's like the most amazing husband. He takes care of me so, so well. And the beautiful thing is like, I didn't, I don't have to be attracted to every man to be faithfully married to the one man God called me to. In fact, sometimes it's quite convenient that I'm not, you know? So in many ways, my marriage is just super normal and boring, you know? It's like, we deal with our six-year-old being crazy at bedtime, like that kind of stuff. It's very, um, yeah, sometimes it feels like, oh, shouldn't that be so strange? But like, as I talk to my other married friends, like it's pretty, it's pretty similar, um, joyful and 
and challenging, but yeah, that's, that's another part of my story that I guess I didn't technically share. Thanks. So how would you define sexual immorality? Well, I would tend to define it using the Greek term because I'm a seminarian, but that's not always helpful. So part of how I think is helpful for us to think about what sexual immorality is, is trying to figure out, well, what has God designed sex for? Like we were talking about, right? So it's clearly designed to be um, a gift that a husband and wife enjoy. It's a gift that relates to faithfulness. It's a gift to um, bring new life into the world. It's a gift related to pleasure. And so uses of sexuality that fall outside of that good positive thing, probably we need to ask like, oh, maybe that's not what God designed it for. There's all kinds of things that fall out of there. Even within marriage, you can use sex to punish your spouse you can withhold sex to punish. like so there's there's all these different ways we can think um pornography is a way to selfishly disconnect from other people to say like i don't need to connect with someone to experience this pleasure i can just do it myself i can um, consume other people like goods as opposed to um as opposed to honoring them or before i was a christian I had this mentality around sex, like, oh, some of my value is wrapped up with either how many sexual partners I have or like the quality of them, you know, and sort of being like, aha, I have identity based on these things. And that's, that's clearly not what God designed sex to do. It's so, sexuality is so powerful um, and we're still made in God's image. So even at times when we use it in ways outside of its design, it can still have some of that magic, right? Because it doesn't, it doesn't completely um, get distorted when it's not used in God's way because it's, it's a good gift in general, but it can rapidly, um, it can rapidly go downhill. So I would just, I come back again and again to what is its purpose in marriage and then examine the various questions I have to see if, whether they fall inside that goodness or whether they fall outside. Thanks. So the next question is if someone experiences same sex attraction is that from God or is that from living in a fallen world? Hmm. That's a really great question. Um, and for a long time, the church was really obsessed about like whether you were born gay or not, because well, it seemed like, oh, yeah, people were saying if you were born gay, then you should just do it. I guess it's natural. But the thing about our theology is, well, we absolutely know that things occur naturally that aren't the way that they're supposed to be because of the fall. So that interesting question between like, does God cause it or is it the fall? Well, even when Jesus interacts with the man born blind in the gospel of John and they're like, who sinned, this man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus is like, nobody. Like I did this so that God's glory would be man. Like the father did this so his glory would be manifested in this man. I do think scripturally we should understand that same-sex attraction is not the way God designed us to be. This is a part of my sexuality that's fallen. However, the way that God manifests himself in the lives of disciples who experience same-sex attraction brings himself glory. Because when I say no to my temptations and yes to Jesus, I'm not saying, well, these, you know, uh, sexual and romantic relationships with women aren't really that cool. So I guess I'll say yes to Jesus because this thing's sort of lame and like, he's all right. If actually what I'm saying to anything sexual is, this is a very good and powerful thing, but Jesus is even more valuable, then suddenly my attraction becomes an opportunity to display the fact that he is worthy. And so I don't get too caught up on the question of where it comes from. I instead try to focus on what does it mean for me to thrive in Christ in the midst of it? Um, if you are LGBTQ, does that mean you have to be single? Well, no, I'm married. So <laughs> no, it definitely does not. And that's the thing is like, does it mean if you're straight, do you have to be married? Like, no, there is so much flexibility in how God wants to work in our lives. And so I don't think identifying as LGBTQ is an automatic choice for singleness. Although I think we do need to do better in the church at honoring singleness 
because plenty of us who experience same-sex attraction will not get married. Plenty of us who are straight will not get married for a variety of reasons. And we're stronger as a church when married and singles together are living out our Christian life. Um, do you feel fulfilled in your marriage if you still have other feelings? Yeah. Well, I think that's a good question. And it's, it's important to remember too, this is the time where it's like, this is just my story. Like I don't, you never want to take one story and just laminate it on all other people. Like I've got other friends who are following Christ with same sex attraction and their experience is really different than mine in a ton of ways. Right. So this is a case where I'm answering for me. But I have to say, yes, the Lord has actually brought healing into my sexuality. So he hasn't changed my base level attractions, but there's been ways that he has brought healing and health to my sexuality through my marriage. I could have never anticipated just weird, bad, broken attitudes I had about it, that years of faithful enjoyment of my spouse have, have brought wholeness to. And it's been really good. And honestly, even though I talked to my other friends, like, basically every married person experiences times when they're attracted to someone who's not their spouse. So it's not like I experience something that's like crazy foreign to people who are married. It's actually just like what everybody who's married feels. And so you're like, oh, okay, we've got, we've got ways to deal with this, right? Like we say, we say no to our temptations and yes to this uh, calling that God's given us. <laughs> How can you love and support a friend who is same sex attracted and wants to be faithful to Jesus? Are there any ways that friends walked and loved you that stuck out? Oh my gosh. This question deserves like a whole seminar of its own, right? Like normally when I talk, I have a whole, have a whole segment on this question, but I cut it off because we didn't have enough time. How do I answer this shortly? Yes. So here are the ways that my friends love me really well. All of my friends in my campus ministry and my church were straight. Sometimes it occasionally can sound like, oh, if there's no one else like me, like how am I supposed to survive? But like most of us feel sexual desire and like have to like fight to uh, be obedient to Christ. And so I think one of the ways my friends really loved and supported me was they didn't think that my temptations were weird or made me gross. Now, Gen Z doesn't te technically have a problem with this. It's like when I talk to boomers, they're still like, oh, I don't know. Um, but Right. So there's a one way they'd help me. It's just like they treated me like they were normal. But the other way that they helped me was they ag agreed with what the Bible said. Right. They didn't. Sometimes we can feel like, how do I put this? Sometimes certain Christians, certain churches accidentally agree with what the Bible teaches about marriage being for male and female they don't actually believe it theologically. They haven't done deep heart pain work. They, really, they just believe it culturally and it happens to accidentally agree with the Bible. And so they say they believe it. And then they just become big assholes, right? They just become big, big jerks. And the way that the church has treated LGBT people um, is shameful and sinful. So what happens sometimes is because there's been such a conflation with what looks like the traditional view and horrific treatment of LGBT people, because we've see, often seen that lumped together, it can feel like, well, maybe the only way to love my gay friends is to say, well, maybe God's okay with this. It's never loving to call something good that God calls sin. What was over here was always sinful and wrong, not necessarily because of the theology, but because, not because of the theology about sex and marriage, the theology about loving people was completely wrong. If your theology is right and your love is wrong, everything's wrong, right? <laughs> like it's just, it's just wrong. And sometimes we can tend to overcorrect and think, well, maybe I just need to do something completely different. What I'd love to see us do as we support each other, including same-sex attracted disciples, is to say, hey, maybe we all need grace and truth over time. Maybe all of us experience and express our sexuality in ways that fall short of what God said. And maybe we all need grace and truth over time. I have so many more things I want to say, but it's just not, it's just not time. Um, yeah, another question about your marriage. So are you attracted to your spouse? And if not, what does that relationship look like? Oh, it's 
such a weird, such a weird question. When you've been married over 10 years, you're sort of like, how does this question even make sense anymore? Because over time, your relationship like grows and matures anyway. But I do remember early on, so I'd, I'd had a couple relationships with other women that felt very like what you hear about in movies and songs, explosive fireworks, butterflies, like, ah, just all the things, right? And it felt like that's really what romance and love is. And as I got to know um, my future husband, I realized I'm like, oh, maybe there's something like he's, he's such a great guy. I really like him. Maybe there's something here, but instead of feeling like this big explosive firework thing, it kind of seemed like, you know, a little flame that you had to, you know, cup your hand around it so the wind wouldn't blow it off. So it's like real, but it's this different level. And I thought, oh my God, you can't build a marriage on this, right? It's supposed to be this other thing. Like this doesn't look very wise. And it forced me back again to what scripture says. And I realized sex is a key component of marriage. If you can't give your body to your spouse and receive your spouse's body with joy, then something's going to go wrong. I mean, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 7. However, this like romantic passion sort of thing, it's not necessary for gospel marriage. Um, in fact, like gospel marriage is a long haul ultra marathon, not like a sprint around the block. So frankly, so the real question is, yes, I am attracted to my husband, but, um, but I married him before I fell in love with him. It's like, I loved him, but I wasn't in love with him. And I've learned, uh, so I had a little bit of attraction, but really I've learned over time to like lean into what our marriage is. It's so like, how do you even explain it? It's so hard. So it's like, I, I love him and I want to be with him, but um, it's not necessarily the same, that I, the same way that I've always felt drawn sort of instinctually towards women, but it's a real thing. I think it's a gift from the Lord. Um, it's not something I feel towards other men. Although I did take a trip to Italy once and there were these Italian waiters. I'm like, these are sort of like the closest version of men I've gotten to in general being attracted to. And I wasn't sure that felt like a strange, that threw me off a little bit, but it's not typical at all. Sorry, um, that's a little, this is like way past my bedtime. So I'm getting <laughs> You're great. Um, so I do want to acknowledge that we're past time, but we have two more questions. Oh, yeah, that's great. So if you could, yeah, briefly just share your thoughts and if people need to leave, that's okay. But I want to, I will take it deeply. I think I they're good. Um, so regarding your fourth point of marriage, uh, where you talked about love across mm -hmm. differences, how do we think about that in terms of same sex relationships where there are things like bigger personality differences yeah. or such? Mm -hmm. non-sexual differences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is a really important point um, because there's all kinds of differences between people, right? Like Enneagram numbers. I mean, I know that's just astrology for college educated people, but still I'm a five, so I get it. Um, or there's things like racial difference, cultural difference, age difference. Like there's all kinds of ways that we can be different. So it's not in any way designed to disparage other types of difference. Like God made us in all kinds of different ways because together with our differences, even introverts and extroverts, we bring something beautiful to bear. But there is actually something more um, fundamental about the difference than male, a male and female than even anything else. Like the, the actual, how do I phrase this? Oh, now that's past my bedtime too. I'm getting so much less like eloquent on my feet, but the difference between myself and, you know, one of my Asian American friends, it's actually not that great. Like we, we look different, but or, or like, honestly, not really that different, but the difference between male and female goes down to like the cellular level. Like people who study bones from millions of years ago can tell really quickly, those are women's bones versus men's bones. Like it's just a deep down fundamental difference. Now, I'm always going to be a white lady. That's not going to change. But even things like personality, you get into a car crash, you people hit their heads and they're like, they're like totally different people. Some of the stuff about us is quite, um, is actually more changeable than we think. 
Uh, but male and female, one in the poem in Genesis 127, it's a way like in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Uh, it's like a part of way we image God being male and female. Um, and it's the difference that he has consistently linked marriage to throughout scripture. So I guess if he had wanted to make it personality, he could have done that. The difference, of course, I think is that even the way we express our personalities is so different culture to culture, time to time. God's the God of all people, all time, everywhere. Um, but he really, he anchored it in the differences between male and female. There's something just meaningfully different there. And he tagged the metaphor there. And again, I think that's partially because of procreation. As Protestants, I assume we're all Protestants, maybe there's some Catholics here. As Protestants, we hung our hats on the um, birth control ban like hook really fast. So we've actually participated in some of the strong disconnect between sex and procreation. We have to remember too, it's not just like, it's not just the metaphor the procreation thing really matters. Up until like 40 years ago, it was a real big deal that sex produced, like almost always produced babies. Um, so that's another reason why it gets anchored there is the procreation piece. All right, so this is the last question. I'm not gonna take any more questions tonight, but um, so how do transgendered individuals fit into this topic? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. And like, again, that's another, that's one that deserves its own, it deserves its own seminar too. And what's really interesting about this, the last question won't go too long, but we have to understand too, the way that scripture speaks to this question is even different than the way that it speaks to same-sex attraction. I have a positive vision for what marriage is in scripture. And I also have several texts that prohibit same-sex sexual relations both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, fine. But when we get to what sex and gender are in the scripture, um, the scriptures are just, they speak more implicitly than they do explicitly. So one, we've got a biblical and theological difference. Two, we've got this nagging problem that um, the, church, the, the white church in America has been really addicted to taking certain things that were true about like white masculinity and femininity from the middle of the 20th century and just screaming over and over again, these are biblical. And you're like, really? That's interesting. Can you prove it from scripture? And then they just go, it's biblical, okay, it's biblical. So we've got all these stereotypes running around claiming to be biblical that have no scriptural basis. That's another complicating factor. People are really attached to them though. And then of course we have the reality that transgender is an umbrella term for a lot of different experiences. So some people who identify as transgender experience gender dysphoria, like they actually experience alienation psychologically from their biological sex. In one case, you might even think of that similarly to the way we would think about intersex, which we haven't even talked about actually. Okay, so that's one category. Some people choose um, to identify as transgender because they've found the binary repressive, right? And so they wanna say like, I don't, um, maybe I don't wanna be male or female. I wanna exist above the binary or wanna move between it, right? And there's a lot of different reasons people make that decision. Some of it's because of sexism. Some of it's because of the bad ways that we've used the gift of sex and gender. And so it makes sense that when something isn't working, humans try to fix it. We're made in God's image. We're problem solvers. When we come up against a problem, we try to fix it. And actually identifying as transgender, when you consider sexism, when you consider stereotypes, when you consider gender dysphoria, it makes sense as an attempt at a solution. Um, but it can't, like most human solutions, um, it can't always cash in on the, on the checks it writes. And so at the, when it comes to this question in the church right now, we're still very early in being able to offer a theology of the body that's positive and that makes sense. And frankly, I think it's gonna come from Gen Z. So if any of you are listening right now and like the Lord is speaking to you to do good theological pastoral work in gender, like listen to that 
because we don't have it yet. We've got little beginnings, but we don't have it yet and it's what we need. So here's some things we can hang our hat on. We know that God created people in his image, male and female, and that's good. So we know that it's good. We know that when Jesus returned with his resurrection body, he was still identifiably male. It suggests with both creation and the resurrection that male and female is gonna be categories that hold. However, we also know that we live in a fallen world. Some people experience abnormalities in their sex development. Some people experience alienation uh, from their sex. Some people have been hurt by the binary. Some people just don't like it because they want to rebel against anything and it's like popular to do right now. So whenever we're thinking about the transgender question, we've got a ton of things coming in. So where does that fit in? Well, I think one, everybody, everybody, everybody deserves an opportunity to hear the gospel. They don't need to agree with what God said about the gender binary or about their bodies before they hear that there is a person who came from heaven, took on a body himself, and suffered. And in response to our pain, he felt pain. And one of his promises is that when he comes again, and when the new creation is up, ushered in, we're going to receive brand new bodies. And they're going to be spiritual, and they're going to be powerful, and they're going to be whole. And for a lot of us, we could think like, cool, brand new body. But for those of us who experience gender dysphoria, who maybe have never, ever, ever felt at home in our bodies, I think the promise of the resurrection is something we can't even grasp how sweet that will be, that there's actually going to be a time offered um, where the body will actually feel like home and it'll actually feel like a gift instead of something that has to be fought. It doesn't answer all the questions about how we walk alongside our friends who identify as transgender or what we do if we ourselves are wrestling with gender dysphoria or these other questions. But I think it gives us some places to anchor as we ask good questions and try to honor, right? Like love God and love people. Well, thank you so much, Rachel, for blessing us tonight. This is Rachel's book, Born Again This Way. You can't see the again word unless you like move it around. Yeah, it's thinking. kind of light. So Born Again This Way. Uh, Rachel, if you have any other great resources that you know of, if you'd love to pop them in the chat, that would be helpful. Um, but if you have other questions, if you as students have other questions, um, please reach out to us as staff. Um, yeah, we'd love to sit down and connect with you. Um, and, but yeah, I'm so grateful for you, Rachel. We're going to pass it back to Lauren.